Welcome back, everyone in the world. Laszlo Montgomery, the China History Podcast, number 214. Well, that six-part series is now behind us, and it's onwards to something else. Namely, this. I got another good one for you, and a timely one at that. I've been saving this person for a long time. Another topic that made the original list I came up with way back in 2010, and only seeing the light of day today in 2019. And for special reason, too. Gu Weijun, V.K. Wellington Ku, or more popularly referred to in many history books as Wellington Ku. His time on the world stage was long enough ago where he's not that well remembered today. But like Li Hongzhang in the late Qing, Wellington Ku in the early part of the 20th century during the Republican era, he was, for many in the West, the face of China. He had the dubious distinction of being on duty during some of the worst decades of China's so-called century of humiliation. So, why is it the perfect time to introduce Wellington Ku? You know, this year, 2019, is the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. And since the Paris Peace Conference began on January 18, 1919, and I thought we could use Wellington Koo's life as an interesting prism to look at those times from exactly a century ago. As I say this anyway, in January 2019, V.K. Wellington Koo was born January 29th, 1888. The V.K. in front of his name, well, that stood for the Shanghainese pronunciation of his given name, Wei Chun. The Shanghainese version romanized it V.I., K-Y-U-I-N. His ancestral roots were in Hunan. His father, like a lot of others, ended up in Shanghai after fleeing the horrors of the Taiping Rebellion in the countryside. His mother was a traditional Chinese wife, bound feet, the whole nine yards. Not a lot written about Madame Ku. Mr. Gu, the elder, got into the hardware's business. Right industry, right time, right place. The family did well and prospered. Lots of government contracts. A fortune was slowly built, real estate mostly. Mr. Gu rose high, and in the end, he went on to retire as president of Jiao Tong Yinhang, the Bank of Communications, newly established back then. The Gu family, their base was in Jiading, northern Shanghai, in between Kunshan and Baoshan. But they kept a residence inside the international settlement, and it's in the international settlement where Wellington Ku was raised. Nice place to live back then if you had the kind of money the, the Gu's had. Now, this is still the Qing dynasty, mind you, when Wellington Ku was born late in the 13th year of the Guangxu Emperor's reign. Ku was seven years old when the Treaty of Shimonoseki was signed in 1895, to give you a frame of reference. And growing up in the international settlement, young Wellington Koo got to see plenty of the injustices China had to put up with inside their own homeland. Extraterritoriality, in particular, stuck inside his craw, as it would anyone, I suppose. Anyone who saw or heard him speak knew Wellington Koo was an extremely educated man. Very much at home in multiple cultures, he was as cosmopolitan as they came back in his time. His youth was spent at the best missionary schools in Shanghai, St. John's College, most notably, founded in 1879 by American missionaries. Notable St. John's alums included Lin Yu Tang, I M Pei, Rong Yi Ren, and T V Song, brother to the Song sisters, mentioned so many times before. In its day, this was the best school of its kind in Shanghai. If one was looking for an angle into the Shanghai old boy network from the ground up, St. John's was your golden ticket. Besides all the local doors that were open to St. John's alums, they had associations with universities in the U.S., and St. John's grads had an easy in at the most prestigious institutions of higher learning. After the turn of the century, many of China's youngest and brightest, over 25,000 of them, went to Japan to study. That's where many of China's future leaders went to get an education and to see for themselves how 
Japan had managed to rise as high and mighty as they had become. But Wellington Koo, he was with the group of young students who ended up in America. 1903, 15 years old, he made his first trip to the U.S., attending a prep school near Ithaca, New York, and then moving on to Columbia University from 1905 to 1912. He thrived at Columbia and became a major guy there. He was also president of the Chinese Students Association, an umbrella organization for a number of Chinese associations in the U.S. He got to meet Sun Yat-sen when he passed through New York on his U.S. tour. There in New York City at Columbia, Wellington Koo learned to become a very effective speaker and an excellent debater, skills he would use well throughout his career. He was among 40 Chinese students who were invited to Washington, D.C. by the head of the legation in 1908 to meet the visiting statesman Tang Shaoyi. Tang, the first premier of the Republic of China, was in D.C. prospecting for young Chinese minds who he could recruit to bring back to China and help run the fledgling Republican government. Tang was one of Yuan Shikai's people for a while. He was quite impressed with Wellington Ku. Ku went back to China briefly to get married. This marriage that his father had arranged was ill-fated. After the wedding, Ku took his bride back to America. She hated it there and fled back to Shanghai, where the unhappy couple ultimately divorced. Ku had later written of China's traditional arranged marriage system. It had made, quote, Hundreds of thousands of families unhappy and millions of lives of the ill-fated couples miserable, end quote. While Ku worked on his master's and Ph.D. in poli-sci at Columbia University, everything was reaching a crescendo as far as the slow, agonizing demise of the Qing dynasty. After 1911, the dynasty fell and China was racked with all kinds of new problems, chief among them a split in the ruling coalitions in China. Yuan Shikai and his Beijing-based government in the north, with all their firepower and diplomatic recognition, they stepped into the shoes of the Qing government. But there was also the rival southern government, led by Sun Yat-sen and his followers. And Sun Yat-sen Well, he didn't have the army, but despite that, he was still quite a brand name in 1911. There was some overlap in ideology, but neither one of these two factions was willing to yield to the other about the new post-imperial power structure. Amidst this well-known turmoil from Chinese history, Wellington Koo began his career in public service. In May 1912, Tang Shaoyi had recruited young Wellington Ku to become the English-language secretary to Yuan Shikai. Now, this appointment in 1912 to Yuan's office was Ku's big career break. He was only 24 years old at the time and already a secretary in Yuan's cabinet. So he left New York and went back to China, to Beijing, first sailing to Europe and then taking the Trans-Siberian all the way back to China. And he went to work for Yuan Shikai. And he didn't just get a plum assignment in Beijing. So impressed was Tang Shaoyi with Wellington Ku. After that first marriage fizzled out in 1908, Tang arranged for his own daughter, May, to become Mrs. Ku II in June 1913. And with this marriage to Tang Shaoyi's daughter, Ku held a strategic foot in both the northern Beijing government, where he was employed, and with the southern government where his father-in-law later served after breaking with Yuan Shikai. Wellington Ku can now be either trusted or mistrusted by both sides. Well, we all know the story. Later on in 1915-1916, Yuan Shikai started getting these imperial aspirations. And being president of China wasn't good enough, and he had his eyes on the emperorship. And this led to a wave of Yuan's followers abandoning ship and defecting to the south. As I just mentioned, Tang Shaoyi was one of the leaders who had given up on Yuan Shikai and bolted for the south and joined the southern regime for a while. Wellington Ku, being one of his protégés, followed Tang as far as Tianjin before he was enticed back to Yuan's camp with an appointment as an assistant 
to the foreign minister, W. W. Yen, Yen Hui Ching, Wei Ching Williams Yen. And with this appointment, Ku's diplomatic career was off and running. Yan Hui Ching is on the list of future topics. Actually, it was Yan Hui Ching who was the one who had arranged that meet and greet in D.C. between Tang Shaoyi and these Chinese students studying in the U.S. Yan was head of the Chinese legation in Washington at the time. July 28, 1914, World War I started, and the following month, on August 1914, the Japanese snatched those parts of Shandong where the Germans had their naval base, present-day Qingdao, called Jiaozhou back then. They just went in and took it. The German Navy was far from home and outgunned by the Japanese. The Chinese just stood by helplessly and watched. The British were ecstatic and thought the Japanese had really done them a solid. I mean, having the German Navy neutralized in China provided the British with some degree of relief. This allowed them to take their eye off this ball. Now their concession at Weihai Wei in Shandong was safe against any possible moves by the Germans. And of course, Hong Kong too. The Germans couldn't cause any mischief for them down there. Plus, with the Germans out of the way, Britain could breathe easy with respect to trade along the China coast. As far as Britain was concerned, it was a case of, thanks Japan, I won't forget this. The Chinese, on the other hand, were not so thankful. And so, to talk up this issue and school the Western nations about the outrageousness of what Japan had just gone and done in Shandong, the northern government in Beijing looked to young Wellington Ku to go hit the road and get the word out to the Americans and Europeans and persuade them to line up with China against Japan with respect to what had just happened in Shandong. He went to the U.S. first, you know, being a Columbia alum, allowed him expedited access to various influencers in the government. But after presenting his case to all those he got to schmooze in person, after listening to his pleas, these American officials told Wellington Koo essentially that what he was saying was all very compelling, but this ain't our fight. The following year, in January 1915, came Japan's 21 Demands their big gimme up in Manchuria. If you remember from previous episodes, when Japan made the 21 demands, even they knew they were so outrageous and so disrespecting of China and normal accepted ways of carrying out diplomacy that the Japanese negotiators, they, well, they didn't use these words, but they said, don't tell anyone about this agreement. Otherwise, we're going to look terrible in front of the Western powers. And as you recall, the secret got leaked anyway. Wellington Ku was the leaker. And Woodrow Wilson and the other Western powers, as predicted, saw what Japan was up to and you know, started wagging their finger at them and collectively said, not so fast with those 21 demands. And the document ended up getting watered down to 13 demands, but they were still pretty bad. And this, more than anything else, ratcheted up the whole Sino-Japanese conflict. The government called on Ku to craft a reply to Japan and tell them what to do with these 21 demands. And with his encyclopedic knowledge of international law, he emphasized in his response that Japan had illegally forced this whole treaty on China, and that it was signed under duress. If China didn't sign, Japan would declare war or carry out some devastating military action against China. Wellington Ku, in making this particular argument was fairly confident that come treaty time after the war, according to international law, this action taken by Japan would be ruled illegal. He had predicted that whatever agreements or treaties China caved on prior to or during World War I, they'd most likely get a second look after the peace came and the new world order was put in place. So in 1915-16, China's negotiators believed certain distasteful conditions that they had to agree to, well, it was okay to sign on the dotted line. When everything was over, it'd be a whole new ball game and they'd be able to start fresh. They miscalculated on that point. There was plenty of discourse in China about how things were going to change after the conclusion of this great war. And this change was going to come to China and it was going to mean goodbye extraterritoriality, 
special rights and privileges for foreign powers, and hello respect for China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Two years into the Great War, when Yuan Shikai died suddenly in June 1916, well, there went Wellington Ku's ultimate benefactor, and after Yuan's big imperial gamble failed, well, to have the taint of Yuan Shikai on you, it wasn't such a good thing at the time. After all, it was Wellington Ku who Yuan sent to Washington in August 1915 to suss out the Yanks on the whole emperor idea. Wellington Ku was a Yuan man all the way, no hiding that or playing that down. Anyway, Yuan died, and with him gone, after that, it was every Chinese warlord for himself. China went from the frying pan and into the fire. Some of the leaders of the southern KMT regime, led by Sun Yat-sen, they had always had their gun sights on Wellington Ku. So at this moment of political uncertainty and weakness, they made a move to arrest him. He knew this was coming and had to hit the road and lay low for a while until he found a new boss. In October 1916, after the post Yuan Shikai shakeout, Duan Qi Rei took control of the levers of power in Beijing and he became Ku's new boss and protector. China's leaders and diplomats, Wellington Ku among them, they knew. Now that China had entered the war on the side of the Allies, and after the Athos had been sunk, February 1917, remember this, 543 China labor corpsmen went down with the ship. Everyone felt certain in China. By breaking off relations with Germany and lining up with the Allies, they were going to reap the benefits come peace treaty time. As the war ground on, Germany started looking like they were going down for the count. Early 1918, Woodrow Wilson came out with his 14 points. This document was meant to serve as a makeshift blueprint for what would happen later on in Versailles. But unbeknownst to most, while all this was going on, Duan Chi Rei, with the assistance of Cao Rulin, would do that thing that earned him eternal infamy from the Chinese people. In his desperation for any kind of financial assistance to his regime, September 28, 1918, he sold out China's interests in Shandong to Japan by concluding the so-called Nishihara loans. This was all done on the hush-hush, and nobody was talking about it yet. A deal this controversial needed to be kept under wraps at all costs. Wellington Ku and many others supposedly in the loop had no idea. So, November 11th, 1918, the war ends, Germany signs the armistice, and all that remained now was the peace conference and the subsequent treaty. Amidst all the planning and strategizing for what lay ahead in Paris, and how was China going to get the best deal, personal tragedy struck Wellington Ku when his wife, Mei Tang, daughter of Tang Shaoyi, became a sudden victim of the 1918 flu pandemic. And the year before, Ku's father had passed away. So the newly widowed Wellington Ku, with two kids to look after, had to severely curtail his period of mourning for his deceased wife and dive headfirst into brainstorming for China's case at the peace table. Because of his familiarity with Wilson and other executive branch officials, there was no question about whether or not Ku was going to be one of China's representatives at the Paris Peace Conference. The prevailing opinion amongst the delegation was that China's big ask at the conference, the Shandong question, well, they thought without the U.S. on their side, they had no chance. As soon as the ink was dry on the armistice, Wellington Ku had to spearhead China's lobbying campaign with any and all U.S. officials. He met with U.S. Secretary of State Robert Lansing, to bend his ear and begin to make China's case and let him know in no uncertain terms where China stood on the matter of territorial integrity and all these past unequal treaties and agreements signed under duress, like the 21 Demands. And he wasn't just gunning for those parts of Shandong province to be restored that Japan was squatting on. He was saying the Kowloon Peninsula and Hong Kong, that too was taken as part of the unequal treaties. You should look at that, too. He had a whole list of grievances. 
He spoke about removing foreign soldiers from Chinese soil, as well as removing all the foreign fingers from China's internal fiscal and economic affairs. And most of all, the one thing that stuck in his craw more than anything else, in the ultimate slap in the face to all Chinese, no more extraterritoriality. He went all over D.C. beating this drum and pretty much got yeah, yeah during this meeting with Secretary of State Lansing and others. Eleven days later, Wellington Koo got 15 minutes of FaceTime with our 28th president, Woodrow Wilson. And in this meeting, he told the president, quote, China would hope to present certain proposals at the peace conference concerning her territorial integrity, the preservation of her sovereign rights, and her fiscal and economic independence, merely to restore to her some of the things which, in the view of the Chinese people, had been wrongly taken from her. So the people of China were all looking to the president and the great country which he represented for help in the realization of their just claims and aspirations. End quote. I'm not sure if this is the meeting where Wilson supposedly said, you could count on me, but Wellington Koo left this meeting with Wilson, hopeful that the U.S. would, in the end, do the right thing. Wilson didn't say yes, but he also didn't say no. And for this reason, Wellington Koo had a premonition that China was going to get screwed. When the Paris Peace Conference finally kicked off, China became their own worst enemy. In 1919, the nation wasn't at war, but it had been almost eight years since the fall of the Qing Dynasty, and there was still no single government that everyone could agree on. The warlords had the North, as well as other parts of China, on lockdown. The KMT-led China government held power down in the southern part of the country. Japan and the other great powers had a field day reminding the Chinese delegation of this state of affairs and asking them which China government they represented, who was calling the shots. Well, before we get into the conference, let's zoom out and look at the Chinese delegation. Their group was 60 strong, including staff and hangers-on. And where did they all stay? <laughs> they all ensconced themselves at the Hotel Lutetia. Today, after all their renovations, it'll set you back over a thousand bucks a night to stay there in Paris. It was still a relatively new establishment in 1919 when the Chinese delegation set themselves up there and had a beautiful Art Nouveau architecture, which back then was still a relatively new look. Wellington Koo was 32 years old at the Paris Peace Conference. It was a young delegation overall, just a couple seniors to give them some gravitas. One of those seniors was 48-year-old Lu Zhengxiang, former ambassador to Russia back when the Tsar was in charge. He led the delegation. Second in command was one of Wellington Ku's nemeses, C.T. Wang, Wang Zhengting. Lu represented the northern faction, and C.T. Wang, along with fellow statesman and diplomat, Albert C., Shi Chaoqi, these two represented the southern government's interest. Everyone wanted the same thing with respect to Shandong, but most of the time they were divided and tried to undermine each other in different ways. You know, they were sending reports back to two different bosses in China. Despite what was going on behind the scenes, however, the Chinese delegation put on the best united face they could. And as their advisor, the Chinese delegation had retained the services of George Morrison, the Australian adventurer and writer, journalist. Some of you who listened to the three Edmund Backhouse episodes remembered him as Backhouse's occasional tormentor with respect to the Jishan Diaries. Anyway, he died right after this conference was over, and this was his final act in his long, interesting career. He was sick most of the time and wasn't able to make much of a contribution. Compared to most of the stodgy old Brits, Yanks, and French, these young Chinese U.S.-educated diplomats knew how to party. And they whooped it up almost every night and attracted a lot of partygoers. Many, like Wellington Koo, with the best Western education money could buy, knew their way around high society. Their dinner parties were the best, and the Hotel Lutetia was rockin' Every night for a stretch, hashish pellets washed down with slow gin fizzes. 
That was one of the hot recreationals being passed around a hundred years ago. Lu Zhengxiang, he did not like the scene, nor the crush of journalists and photographers snapping photos like crazy. He was the top guy, but if it was going to be like this, eh, he took a step back and surrendered his leadership position. He remained the top guy, but he sat in the back seat. C.T. Wang should have been the one to take over the lead role, but the powers back in Beijing appointed Ku in charge. He served as a better bridge between the two main factions in China and was considered the best compromise candidate at the time. So the three main faces representing the Chinese side at the Paris Peace Conference were Wellington Ku, C.T. Wang, and Albert C. These three, from their digs inside the Hotel Lutetia, using an in-house crack team called the Information Bureau, waged a non-stop war of propaganda against Japan and used every well-known trick in the book to smear Japan in every hotel, every newspaper, cocktail party, and informal chit-chat session to spread their poison. Though Wellington Koo and the other two leaders were political rivals, they all agreed on the matter of China's territorial integrity with respect to the Shandong question. And on this point, they all worked in lockstep to do everything in their power to make this happen in China's favor. You could say, knowing the Japanese for about 2,500 years like they did, they understood them better than the Europeans. As the festivities kicked off, Wellington Koo got himself appointed to the Commission for the League of Nations, Woodrow Wilson's big pet project to make the world safe for democracy. This was a big chance for Koo to get more face time with the American president. Wilson's 14 points had really energized the Chinese gathered in Paris and back in China. If Wilson meant what he said, if those words truly represented... Wilson's geopolitical philosophy, everyone on the Chinese side was confident in a good result come the peace treaty. There were signs that offered the Chinese delegation no face whatsoever, claiming that China's role in the war was minimal, having merely supplied workers who didn't do any of the killing. It wasn't so important. The China side also thought they had five seats at the large, U-shaped, peace conference table, but they only got two. One of many slaps in China's face about their role versus everyone else's role in defeating the Kaiser. Rather early on in the proceedings, the Chinese negotiators got a strong vibe from the British and French that, in so many words, said, don't count on us to support you in the matter of Shandong. Regardless of what was the right thing to do or how anyone felt or even the merits of China's case for Shandong, the British and the French had their own interests in Asia. And if China's interests conflicted with their interests, they stood on their own side. Regardless of all this early talk, Ku was still confident he might be able to sway them in the end. The key was making sure Wilson was on China's side. I think we are going to arbitrarily cut things off right here and start off next episode with the actual Paris Peace Conference that was going on 100 years ago from this very moment as I record this in January 2019. We'll pick up next time on January 27th, 1919 at the Quai d'Orsay when Baron Makino Nobuaki, the chief spokesman for the Japanese delegation, presented his case to the Council of Ten. You won't want to miss that, I assure you. Okay, me little beauties. Laszlo Montgomery signing off once again from the city of Los Angeles, coming to you from right around the corner, a heart attack and vine. Do consider joining me next time, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast. <laughs>